صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمن من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم. Sweet, in your gathering with a remembrance of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Mawlana, Al-Imam al Hussein and his honorable family and companions recite the second salawat. <laughs> to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana, Sahib al-Asri wa zaman and for Allah to shower onto this gathering with His infinite mercy and compassion, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. <laughs> LGBTQ, a topic that every religious leader every religious organization and almost every religious person avoids 
a topic that's ignored. And once we ought to face this topic, then we dread talking about it. While the Western world faces a storm, and I truly mean this, a storm, in every way possible, in this new revolution of gender identity, we are no longer given a choice but to face reality and to rise to the occasion. If I choose to ignore this topic from the mimbar, and you choose to ignore this topic at home, and we as a community collectively ignore this topic year in, year out, we don't mention it in our Friday sermons. We don't mention it in our conferences, in our seminars, in our Muharram Majalis. Guess what? It's not going to go away. My children and your children are exposed to this phenomenon as early as the first grade, if not earlier. At school, they are taught that if you are a boy and you are born as a boy, you may no longer identify as a boy. You can identify as a girl. And if you are a girl, you're also free to now be recognized as a boy. You can also be neither a boy or a girl. You can, be, you can identify as transgender. You can identify as non-binary. You can identify as gender neutral, gender queer, two-spirit. And the list goes on, 17, 20 different genders. And you may choose to be none of the above or all of the above at the same time. And if you happen to choose being gender neutral, then in the morning, when you go to school, you can use the girls' bathroom. In the afternoon, you can use the boys' shower at the gym. You can dress as a boy to school and attire as a girl to work. And today, this topic is already everywhere we look. It is in your kids' Legos. It is in your kids' cartoons. It is in your kids' storybooks. It is at your doctor's office. It is at your college and high school. And soon enough, it will be unescapable. You will not be able to watch the news, turn on your television, or leave your house unless you face this new norm, this new normal, this new reality. And the truth is, this topic may seem irrelevant to some people. This topic may make some people uncomfortable. But I want to say one thing, brothers and sisters, and keep that in mind. A majlis, an Islamic institution, 
is not like your shisha cafe. It's not like your restaurant. What do I mean? When you show up at the shisha cafe, you order your, f uh, your favorite flavor. Look, if you don't like a double apple, you're not going to order double apple. You're going to order, for example, something with mint. If that's what you like. That's your favorite flavor. If you, do go, if you go to a restaurant and you happen to like, for example, pasta, you're not going to order pizza. You order what you like and you enjoy it. But guess what? This place is not a shisha cafe nor a restaurant. You're not always going to hear everything that is completely aligned with your ideology and your needs. This place is more like an emergency room and a hospital. Today, this phenomenon exists within our community. And this is a need. And we live in this society, so we must address this topic. We cannot run away from it. And, of course, no discussion is ever going to be perfect. You're not sitting across from an infallible imam or a ma'soom or the most learned person in the history of the manabir. But it does not mean that we run away from reality. I was approached with a friend. I've known him for maybe 15 years. And I hadn't seen him for a very long time. I asked about him. He said, they say he's no longer attending. He's no longer part of the community. He's not very involved anymore. So I reached out to him. We spoke. This person is an honorable man. Religious family. Kids went to Sunday school. They attended mosque. His daughter at the age, I don't know, 19, 20, transitioned into a man. Now she's a man. This is the reality that we have to face. It's not just in your schools. It's going to arrive to the doorsteps of our Islamic centers and our masajid and our majalis and our Islamic institutions. What happens if today when you go to salah, a woman shows up and says, I identify as a man. So I'm going to go and pray with the men. And you are somebody in charge in the masjid. What do you do? What do you do? Islamically, what do you do? You cannot say, well, I don't like this, so I'm not going to let it happen. No, we have to really understand the Islamic opinion. What God wants from us, not what we feel is the right thing to do. Or, let's say a man with a beard, right? Maybe puts a scarf, doesn't, I don't know shows up at the musalla here in the masjid in the prayer hall and stands next to the woman and says look I, I identify as a woman and I'm going to pray with you with the woman now the women are saying if a man stands next to us our whole prayer is void so what do we do get this you're sitting in your office your imam for example of a center of an Islamic institution of a masjid and a woman shows up and she says, I want to marry this young boy. So you're getting started to do the paperwork. And then can I see her ID? She, go, she shows you her ID and on the ID, you look, Abudi, for example, Abdullah something. And you're looking, this guy does not look like Abdullah. Excuse me, is this your ID? Yes, it's my ID. I've gone through a transition. 
I am no longer a man. Now I am a woman. What do you do? Do you marry those two individuals or do you not? Think of this as a, for a moment. You happen to have a sister. Right? You're a man. You happen to have a sister. While your father is alive, your sister goes through a transition. Now she is a man. When your father dies, how do you divide the inheritance? Do you give her the inheritance of a man or do you give her the inheritance of a woman? A person within the community dies. She is a woman. She looks like a woman. She is a woman. In fact, she was the mother of three kids. But during her last days, she identified as a man. Do you wash her as a man or do you wash her as a woman? Do you bury her as a man or do you bury her as a woman? And the list goes on and on and on and on. You see, I say this, I say it was so much easier to be a marja, for example, like a hundred years ago. Even 30 years ago. Because the biggest problem you had was Ramadan. When is Ramadan starting? When is Ramadan ending? Did you see the hilal? Did we not see the hilal? And life goes on. But if you're trying to be a marja in 2022 and onwards, it's going to be much more difficult. If you are a chairman of Islamic institution 50 years ago, you know, there wasn't much you had to worry about. Maybe a couple of guys stood at some dabka in the middle of the center and then you had to figure out, is this okay, is this not okay? But now, you have to deal with all this. And what do we do? Do we just say, you know what? Some people, they think this is the easy, most convenient way out of it. So they say, you know what? Excuse me, I don't mean any disrespect. To hell with them. Who cares? We don't even think about them. Why? Because this somehow is the godly thing to do. This somehow is the Islamic thing to do. And I'm here to tell you, it's neither Islamic nor godly. Why? Number one, if you think it's Islamic, go and take a search engine with all the fiqh books and the books of hadith. Select all the books of hadith, select all the books of fiqh, and then do a search for this word, khuntha, which is neither untha or it's neither a man or a woman. It's neither dhakar or untha. Neither a man or a woman. Khuntha. I did this a few weeks ago when I was researching this topic. And how many results do you think I got? 12,000. 12,000. The word khuntha, which is not a male or a female, is used 12,000 times in one of our search engines. From books that were a thousand years ago, hadiths of course 1400 years ago, books from a thousand years ago, 700 years ago, 350 years ago, but today we have an issue discussing it. Today it's a topic we're trying to avoid. And is it godly? Today, most certainly, it is scientifically and medically proven that some gender confusions are due to medical reasons. Some of those people have medical issues, biological issues, mental health issues. How is it okay for people with other medical conditions to attend, to be spoken to, to receive service from our Islamic institutions, but we bar others from it. They are the creation of Allah. They were also created by Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, some of you might be saying, Sayyid, are you trying to support the LG? No, 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 hold on. We're still at the introduction. But I am most certainly not here to shame anybody or to degrade anybody or to disrespect anybody. Even if we say they are sinners, that's the worst case scenario, right? They're sinners. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to sinners in the Quran. Allah had a dialogue with sinners in the Quran. And sinners also deserve a chance. The least, I'm here to say, the least that human beings deserve is our attention. For them to be heard. You see, why do you think the LGBTQ community is so strong? Have you thought about this? Honestly, have you thought about why are they so strong? When I said a storm, I really mean a storm. You try to stand in front of them, you cannot. They're becoming the most powerful lobbying group in America and around the world. Why? When you choke so many people for so long, then they're all passionate about helping one another. Standing in solidarity with one another. Defending one another. So, kicking them away, not listening to them, ignoring them, most certainly is not the solution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the pillar of Abu Lubabah to exist in the masjid of Rasulullah for a reason. As long as the masjid of Rasulullah exists, that pillar of Abu Lubabah that resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. You think I can sit here and talk about God's mercy and compassion? I can't. I won't be able to. Because I don't comprehend how vast, how great Allah's mercy is. Allah's compassion is. Allah's forgiveness is. I look at things from my human lens. Abu Lubaba comes to Rasulullah. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I've committed a sin. What is your sin, Ya Abu Lubaba? I cannot tell you, Ya Rasulullah. It is so great. It is so shameful. I cannot. No human would do this. Rasulullah says, what have you done? Says, I cannot tell you. Is your sin greater or the earth? Rasulullah asks this man. And he says, my sin. Is your sin greater or the universe? My sin. Allahu Akbar. What has this man done? What could he possibly have committed? What kind of crime? Then Rasulullah says to him, Ya Abu Lubaba, is your sin greater or the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This sinful man, Abu Lubaba, said the mercy of Allah. So he actually had not committed the greatest sin in Allah's books. Because you know what is the greatest sin in Allah's books? To feel that your sin is greater than his mercy. To feel that what you have committed can never be erased or forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is indeed the greatest sin. I cannot tell you the story of Abu Lubaba's sin, but what I can tell you is he would steal the shroud of the dead bodies. A dead body is buried. This guy who goes and digs the grave and removes the shroud and goes and sells it in the market. This wasn't his sin. Let me tell you this way. This wasn't his sin. This was the appetizer to his sin. He goes and he chains himself. And he says, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to move. I'm just going to ask for forgiveness from Allah. Until Allah forgives me. Community ignores him. Community doesn't want to deal with sinners. They don't want to help no sinner. They don't want to help nobody struggling. To hell with him. And he was a criminal. But Allah did not ignore this man. Allah was watching this man. So he sends his special envoy, his most beloved messenger, his greatest messenger, Jubrail. Jubrail. 
Not some random angel. Jibra'il to whom? To Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, go and visit Abu Lubaba. I have forgiven him. He is now sinless. He's, it's not just that that sin was forgiven. He's now a sinless man. Rasulullah goes with his companions. They open the chains. Rasulullah says, glad tidings to you, Ya Abu Lubaba. Allah has forgiven all your sins. So now you are as if the day your mother gave birth to you. You are sinless. This is Jibra'il informing you, informing me of your repentance. Let us take you back. Let us help you. Let us feed you. Let us clothe you. Abu Lubaba says, Ya Rasulullah, am I really sinless? He says, yes. He says, Did you, didn't you teach us that the prayers of a sinless person is answered? He says, yes. He says, oh Allah, I ask you to take my life before I commit any other sin. Abu Lubaba dies right there and then. Jibra'il says, the angels are here to wash his body and take him to paradise. And today, I want to come and close the door of the house of Allah in front of a person who I'm sure, whatever they do, their sin will not be anywhere near the sin of Abu Lubab. Brothers, have you come across homeless people? Of course you have. Mostly at traffic lights, you see a homeless person and you're thinking to yourself, you're sitting in your car, the AC is on. You're thinking, this guy is such a bum. What a useless person. They're just no good. Addicted to drugs, they're homeless, they're dirty, alcoholics. Shame on them. What a waste of a life. That's, that's reality. Most of us think that way. And if you have, you know, 25 cents, maybe a dollar, give it to him. And what do you say? You don't just give it to him. We have to rub it in. Make sure you don't use this to drink, buddy. And he says, oh, God bless you. Thank you. But have you tried talking to those people? Talk to some of them. Spend some time with some of them. You'll be surprised that some of them are very bright people. At one point, they were very accomplished people. I met someone during my travels to Europe. He said, I've traveled to 50 countries. I said, what kind of homeless guy travels to 50 countries? I wasn't homeless. I was a CEO. I was traveling around like a boss. So I was actually waiting. I, I didn't speak the language of where I was. So he was helping me translate free of charge. He wasn't asking for money. Translate for me. It was a guy from Louisiana translating for me. And, uh, and they told me the wait was like 20 minutes. So I said, you know what? Sit with me. I want to talk to you. And you, have you heard of the phrase paradigm shift? I had a complete shift in paradigms. I never looked at homeless people the same ever again. Because I realized behind every one of those people there is a story. And you should ask yourself, if I were in this person's shoes, if you speak to them, you then ask yourself, if I was in this person's shoes, would I have done any better? Would I have made better decisions? Would I have been in a better place? Let's not be so, so quick to judge people and put people down because it's the most convenient thing to do. Let's give people the benefit of the doubt. Let's hear them. Let's talk to them. You know, there was a lot of people that would come. Imagine the ghettos here, for example, in Detroit. And uh, now imagine the ghettos of 
the Arabian Peninsula 1,400 years ago. Right? People would come to Rasulullah, they were just very different, let's put it this way. So one of the ways that they would greet the Prophet was that they would have to hold on to his beard like this. Imagine somebody comes wants to talk to me after the majlis and he grabs my beard like this the whole time. So a lot of the companions would say, Ya Rasulullah, let's give them a, you know, what are they doing? They're touching your beard, they're touching your face. They're so disrespectful. Because the, the tradition says they would pull on as well. For example, when he's saying something important to get more attention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an ayah. خُذِ الْعَفْوَةِ Ya Rasulullah, give them the benefit of the doubt. Those people don't know any better. This guy grew up with goats and cows and he barely sees humans. And he lives in a desert. And he used to worship idols. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Be tolerant of him. And some of those people became the greatest companions of Rasulullah. Just like some people out of the ghettos will become the best Muslims in your community. Let's also give those people the benefit. Let's hear them. Let's listen to them. You know, a transgender is four times more likely to attempt suicide than a normal human being. Than an average person. Four times more likely to attempt suicide... And if you're talking about contemplation of suicide, then it's a daily struggle. Every day of their lives they think of suicide. Because they have been rejected at home, they have been rejected at school, they have been rejected by their families, they have been rejected at their workplace, they have, and they cannot help it. Some of them really, this is something they cannot help. Imagine all this immense rejection and nobody's there to even talk to them. Say, listen, let me, let me try to help you. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, this mimbar is no good if it's not the voice for the voiceless. How many times did I say that last year? And I'll say it again. The divorcees in our community, the single parents in our community, the children from divorced families in our community, the converts of our community, the less fortunate in our community, yes, a person who has to catch the bus to be here, a person who doesn't have proper clothing to wear and attend the majlis. And the list goes on. Those people deserve a voice. They deserve to be understood. They deserve to be heard. They deserve to be treated like normal human beings. And that is why I am taking a risk. Let's be honest, you know. A lot of people will say, what's this say talking about Muslim transgenders and He's even somehow, you know, siding with them on some issues. Look, I'm not here to please anybody. I'm here to please Allah and I will face Allah with I'm about to say. I know that for a fact. I have to face Imam al-Husayn. I have to face the Ahl al-Bayt. But I know that it is not okay if we allow someone in our community, in our family, to contemplate suicide and attempt suicide on a daily basis, and if we can help them, we ignore them. That is why I want to talk about this topic tonight, and this is why I chose this specific title. Transgender Muslims. 
Why? Because I'm not going to be talking about sinful people immersed in sin, living a life of sin. I don't want to talk about people who are just following their desires. I don't want to talk about people who uh, are indecent. I don't want to talk about people who have no self-control and no self-respect and no self-dignity. Whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. Right? Say it, are you trying to say that, for example, homosexuality is okay? Who am I to say that? Allah has said it's haram. Who am I to say it's halal? How can I ever make something haram halal? That's not what I'm saying. That's not what we're discussing. I'm here to say that some of those individuals are decent people. They are Muslims. They're practicing Muslims. Some of them are the lovers of Ahlul Bayt. And you would be surprised when I announced this topic, I had a storm of emails from transgender Shia Muslims. One of them said, Sayyid, if you bash us, I will commit suicide, period. Because I've been listening to you for so many years. I've been bashed and rejected from every single part of my life. If you bash me, I'm just going to kill myself. I was not... I didn't choose to be this way. I have a struggle every single day. And you want to sit on the minbar and bash me? So I'm not going to bash anybody. I said this the other day when I was talking about, is God an illusion? I said, we want to have a dialogue. We want to talk. We're not here to fight. So I want to focus on people who are decent. People who want to have a relationship with Allah. People who want to feel the warmth of a family, a circle of friends, a community. To be respected, to be treated like normal human beings. This is the focus of my topic. And I want to dissect it in the following way. Number one, how many genders do we have in Islam? According to the Quran, this book revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the heart of the last messenger, Muhammad. How many genders do we have? Number one. And we'll discuss the variety of opinions. Number two. What is the difference between sex and gender? Number three. Can we have a gender change as Muslims? And number four. How can we protect our children from things that we fear? وَصَلُّوا عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ The first opinion, how many genders do we have according to the Quran? The first opinion is that we have two genders. Why? Because of the ayah that I began my lecture with, Surah Al-Hujurat, chapter 43. O people, O the children of Adam, O human beings, we have created you from dhakarin wa untha. And that's it. There is no dhakar, untha, khuntha, transgender, uh, you know, neutral gender, two-spirit gender. No, it's dhakar wa untha. So, there is no other third gender and we cannot have, you know, other genders. But I want to take your attention to another ayah. So that is the first opinion. Now let's look at the second opinion. In Surah An-Nahl. Surah An-Nahl, ayah number, Surah An-Nahl 16, 78, verse 78. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'lamuna shay'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave life to you out of your mother's womb. You were born and you didn't know a thing. Waja'ala lakum usama'a wal absara wal afida. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you ears to hear with, eyes to see, and a mind to judge with. So you continue to learn and you become the human beings that you are today, right? This is in Surah An-Nahl, 16, verse 78. Other scholars have come and said, but there are people who are born deaf, and there are people who are born blind, and there are people who are born without the ability to judge. What about them? 
So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about gender within the Holy Quran and defines both genders, yes indeed, that is the vast majority of people. And that is why transgenders or all this LGBTQ and all the power they have and all the... They're only 3%. Transgenders are less than 1%. So Allah doesn't speak of less than 1% small minor exception. Allah is speaking of a general rule. Just like in this ayah when he says you are born and you have hearing ability and you have vision and you have the ability to judge. The vast majority of people are, are born that way. But do we have people who are born blind? Do we have people who are born deaf? Absolutely. So Islam does not say that, yes, the vast majority are three genders. But it does not speak of gender confusion. Why? Because there are many factors. There are many factors that play a role in someone's life until they're confused about their gender. You know, sometimes it's not even them. It's their parents. Something happened with the parents. Um, there is a book by Oprah Winfrey. Please try to take, read this book. It's called What Happened to You. What is it called? What happened to you? And it basically talks about every question that we have about ourselves. You know, why do I get upset? Instead of saying, why do I get upset? Let me ask what happened to me so I understand why I'm getting upset. Why do I get jealous? Why am I, you know, for example, a workaholic? Why can't I commit to a relationship? There, there is something very interesting that she says. She says, actually... She's, she's, a, she's wrote this book with a co-author, Dr. Perry. And uh, she asks him, she says, why do some people, why are some people afraid of dogs? You know, Arabs, we're not very friendly with dogs. And we don't know why. Really, we don't know why. You know, when I see a dog, I get nervous. That's the reality. I get nervous. And I don't know why. I know this dog's not going to bite me. Probably. I know that he's not going to do anything, but I'm still nervous. And I didn't know why. Well, Dr. Perry says. He says, because the fear of dogs can be sent down, passed down, inherited. So my fourth generation grandfather was, for example, bit, this, is, this is not an illusion. This is a fact. Was bit by a dog. And now I'm still nervous about dogs. So she says that in, for example, many of the states, they used to use dogs against black people, chase black people, runaway slaves. That's why he says black people are, are, tend to be more afraid of dogs than other people. Why? Because it's passed down, it's inherited. So when you look at this person, don't just blame the person. It could be something that is inherited. Something that's been passed down. Number two. Can we have gender transition? Is it allowed? The first response from the vast majority of the ulama refers to Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 111, 119. That says, no, you cannot. Why? Because Surah An-Nisa... Verse 119 speaks of change in human body because of shaitan's influence on human beings. So shaitan says, Ya Allah, one of the ways that I'm going to influence human beings is to make them change things around in their bodies. And they say, well, this is very obvious that the greatest change is to actually change your identity, change your gender. So, it is not allowed. But we do have ulama. We do have maraji'. We do have fuqaha. I don't agree with them. Habibi, who are you to agree or disagree? Have you read the books? Have you looked at the hadiths? Have you done your investigation? Have you done your research? The longest period you've spent at a hawza was when you went to the ziyarah trip in Najaf through the walk. Those people have spent 40 years, 50 years researching. Some of them, this is their opinion. That if 
Obviously not. I wake up one day. Today I wake up. I look at myself. Oh, I want to be a girl. So I go and change myself into a girl. A few years later, no, the popular thing is now not to be a girl. Let me switch. No, no, no. That's, that's not like that. No. It goes through rigorous research, medical doctors, examinations, hormonal imbalances, so on and so forth. Then if it is what it is, then you can transition. Now what is the difference between gender and sex? Your sex is what you're born with. Your biological organs, reproductive organs. You're born as a boy or you're born as a girl. That's what the doctor says on your birth certificate. You're a boy or you're a girl. But your gender is what you identify as. You are a man trapped in a woman's body. Or a woman trapped in a man's body. Does this happen? If it happens, if it is possible, if it is scientifically proven, if it is medically proven, that's what the marajah say, then this person who's trapped into the wrong body can transition into his normal body. In fact, I received one extensive email, very long email, back and forth conversations with a Shia transgender. And this is what she told me. And I'm sure she's watching right now. That I hated myself every day of my life until I transitioned. Now I look at myself and I'm happy about myself. I accept myself as who I am. Now, do I understand what that means? No. Have I ever felt that way? No. The majority of you, probably not. But it doesn't mean that we deny the fact that there is a possibility that this may exist in some people. Now, while this discussion makes people nervous, it's not the most comfortable thing to talk about, right? What is important for us to talk about, brothers and sisters, is how do we protect our children from things that we, are, we fear? And you know exactly what I'm talking about. How do we do that? How do we protect our families? You know, you, you hear stories about, just yesterday somebody was telling me that La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. I, I don't even know if I should say this. 120 janaas of young men were buried in one month in this city because of gun violence amongst themselves. Drugs, opioid, heroin, suicide from our community, huh? Don't think this is, we're talking about, you know, other people. And we hear about them and we're, we're afraid. If you're a father, if you're a mother, if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You sometimes cannot sleep at night. Being so nervous, being so occupied with such thoughts. How do we deal with it? We are here to look at the example of Qasim, Aliyun al-Akbar, the camp of Imam al-Hussein. Just seems like such a utopia. How can we ever have, right now we're just thinking, you know, I hope my son ends up, you know, just dating a girl. I'm good. That's how bad things are. Right? How do we, how do we go about protecting ourselves and our families? And I tell you, the primary solution, the primary solution, it's not the only solution, the primary solution, is for you to invest in your communities. Invest in your community. Invest in volunteering at your community. Invest your life savings at your community. Drain your bank account. Be it. If this is what it takes, do it. 
If it means that you do not buy the latest, latest S500 this year, don't. Take that extra money and give it to your Islamic institution, Islamic centers. Why? Because they are the first shield. But what kind of Islamic center? Islamic center open Thursday nights, Dua Kumail. 60 plus seniors, they get together, they read Dua Kumail, and then they drink some chai and they leave. No. An Islamic institution that's willing to talk to your kids. Spend time with your kids. That's willing to talk about relevant issues. That's willing to have, you know, sport. Because today, all, you can't bring in kids every day. 365 days out of the year and say, here's a one hour lecture, yalla. That's not going to happen. We need sports festivals. We need conferences. We need trips. We need camps. We need gymnasiums. We need art. We need people to network with one another. This guy is good at, for example, marketing. She's good at, for example, uh, something else. And they get together and they work on a project. They get to know each other. They become the resources of the community. Those people in front of me are the future of this community. This is the best investment, brothers and sisters. I kid you not. And don't just drop off your kids and, and then you go somewhere else and then you come back and you're sitting in the car and like, ah, who cares what happened? No, talk to them. See if this majlis that you dropped them off to was beneficial, keep taking them. If it's not beneficial, take them somewhere else. Make sure that when they go to an Islamic institution, they're eager to sit and listen, not eager to run away and not listen. And that is the best investment. That is how we can protect our families. Number two, it's your job to also be part of their lives, to speak with them, to work with the Islamic institution. If you have ideas, bring them. Volunteer. And truly, brothers, sisters, my beloved friends, you are blessed here. You are blessed here with an amazing leadership. Samahat al Allama Sayyid Hassan al Qazwini. He's a great leader. You have one of the best. America's finest. A man truly that has dedicated his life for this community. For 20 plus years. And mashallah, this community, I said this last year and I'm saying it now. It will go down in history that this Dearborn community is one of America's finest communities. The soldiers of the Ahl al-Bayt. Inshallah. But it doesn't stop here. I say this, and inshallah, we move on to the masa'ib. The people in those four walls are important. But people outside those four walls are as important. There should be nothing that stops people that are outside those four walls from being inside those four walls. Let's not find excuses to drive people away. Let's find excuses and ways to bring people, to be inclusive, to show them the warmth of a community, to be truly an ummah, to look after one another, to protect one another, to conceal each other's mistakes. And tonight belongs to a special man in the camp of Imam al Hussein. His story says it all. Hurr ibn Yazid al Riyahi. And I said this, and I will say it again you will not find anybody in your community that has a bigger sin than Hurr ibn Yazid al Riyahi. And Imam al Hussein embraced him. While he was in need of help, he says, Ya. Ya Aba Abdullah, I regret my sin. Imam al Hussein didn't say, push him down. Imam al Hussein used his hands to tell him, rise, rise, stand up. It's enough. You're regretful? It's enough. 
And I say this to brothers and sisters who are listening to me. Whether your sin or your mistake is relevant to tonight's topic or something else, you can be a hur. And you should decide to be a hur. And you should want to be a hur immediately, right this moment. So hur comes to Imam al Hussein. He says, يا ابن رسول الله هل لي من توبة Imam al-Hussain says, توب تاب الله عليك Hur stands up to go and fight the enemies Imam al-Hussain says, disembark from your horse He says, لا يا ابن رسول الله أنا لك راكبا خير Allow me to stay on my horse, Ibn Rasulullah. I'm here to give you my life. Hur went and he fought bravely and he defended Imam al Hussein until he fell. Imam al Hussein went to this man. Imagine what kind of heart Imam al Hussein had. He held no grudge against him, he ran to him, he held him. He said, You are a free man. Just like your mother named you. Meaning ultimately you are a free man. You made the right decision. But I want to remind you brothers and sisters of a moment on the 10th of Muharram. Yes the body of Hur was laying there. But so was the body of Hussein. So was the body of Abbas. So was the body of Ali al Akbar. When the battle finished Umar ibn Sa'd said who is there to tremble the body of the enemies of Allah. Allahu Akbar. So a few individuals sat on the back of their horses to go and stampede the body of Imam al Hussein and his companions. What happened? Some of the tribe of Hur came and said, No, no way, we're not going to allow you to do that. Hur is from our tribe. We're going to take Hur and we're going to bury him and we're going to give him an honorable, honorable burial. As Sayyida Zainab was looking, she said, she said Oh Allah, Allah, be a witness that, that the grandson of Rasulullah Rasul is left with no tribe, no Ansar, no one to come and save the body of the grandson of Rasulullah. They sat on the back of the horse. And they stampede the body of Aba Abdullah. But look at Hussein today. Look at where his body is buried today. Look at those who sit and they mourn Imam al Hussein. We send our hearts with whom? With Sahib al Zaman. Sahib al Zaman, who just like you is now wearing black and he's shedding tears on his grandfather Rasulullah. And he's and his grandfather his Imam al-Hussein and he says to his grandfather Imam al-Hussein, Ya Jadda, Ya Aba Abdullah, La'abkiyannaka badala dumu'i dama, wa la'andubannaka sabahan wa masa'a. I shed tears of blood for you, Ya Aba Abdullah. And I cry for you in the morning and the day. How can I ever forget the masa'ib that befell onto you? So with Sahib al-Zaman, with all the lovers of Hussein all around the world, brothers, sisters, my friends, raise your voice. Ya Sayyidina wa Maulana وَاسْتَشْفَعْنَا وَتَوَسَّلْنَا بِكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَقَدَّمْنَا كَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ حَاجَاتِنَا يَا وَجِيهًا عِنْدَ All of us together, brothers, sisters, raise your voice. The lovers of Imam al Hussein, the soldiers of Imam al Hussein, MashaAllah. Ya wajihan inda Allah.
يا وجيها In such nights, traditionally, they remember one of the most noble individuals in the history of Ashura, one of the heroes of Ashura, a woman who had four sons, and she gave every single one of them for Imam al Hussein. And she said, if I had a hundred sons, I would give them to become a sacrifice for Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein. That woman is no other than the mother of Abu al Fadl al Abbas, Umm al Bani. Allahu Akbar, Umm al Bani went to her son, Abu al Fadl, her other sons. She said to them, Make sure that you make me proud on the day of judgment. I don't want to have to look at the face of Fatima to Zahra and say, My sons remained alive while your son Fatima had to face a battlefield. You must go before Hussein. And this was an agreement that they had. The camp of Imam al Hussein left Medina, and when it had returned to Medina, Imam Zainul Abidin, Zainul Abidin says, says to, a to a person, go inside the city of Medina and announce the arrival of the camp of Imam al Hussein. Tell them that the camp of Imam al Hussein had returned, but it's left with so many men, and now it's come back with no men. So this man entered the city of Medina at the gates. He said, Ya ahla yathribala muqam alakum biha. يا أهل يثرب لا مقام لكم بها. All the people of Medina, you will not be able to tolerate this news. ما الخبر? What is the news? الخبر عند جده رسول الله. I'll give you the news next to the grave of his grandfather, Rasulullah. People gathered, all people left their homes, their market, they came in front of the grave of Rasulullah. This man again said, Ya ahla yathrib, la muqam alaykum biha, qutil al قتل الحسين فأدمعي مدرار Hussein has been slain all the people of Medina Allahu Akbar where is Hussein where is his body they tell him الجسم منه مخضب بكربلا the body is in كربلا والرأي And the head is on top of his fear, going from one city to another. Allahu Akbar. As Sayyida Zainab went to her home, she said, I don't want any disturbance. They came to her, they said to her, Oh, the daughter of Amir al Mu'mineen, there is one woman behind the door. She says, She must see you. Who is this woman? She says, My name is Umm al Bani. Sayyida Zainab went rushing towards the door. They open the door. The first thing that she tells her, she wants to let her know that, look, none of your sons are coming back. She said to her, Wa akhah wa abbasa wa qamar bani hashima Qamar bani Hashim is no longer coming back. Abbas is no longer coming back. What does Sayyida Umm al Banin say? She says, Wa walada huwa Husayna. Wa walada huwa Madluma. Brothers, for a moment, all together, I know this is the moment that you want to repay your allegiance to Imam al Hussein. And you want to tell him that I wish I was there on the 10th of Muharram so that I can also go before Abbas, before his brothers. Hussein, <laughs> 
لبيك يا حسين ما شاء الله Sisters with Umm al with Zainab, brothers with all the young men in the camp of Imam al Hussein. One more time, as loudest as you can. Labbayka ya Hussein. MashaAllah. Labbayka ya Hussein. Labbayka ya Hussein. Ya Aba Abdullah, be a witness to all those people who are here, who are your servants, who are your lovers, who are your soldiers. One more time, Labbayka Ya Hussein.